Okay. Um, yes, good morning all. Um, my name is Sir Kibra. I'm Deputy Editor at Nature Communications and I'm chair of this panel. Um, yeah, we have three panelists today. Um, there's Karen Fultitude. Um, she's a senior lecturer in science communication at UCL and director of the uh, director of research in the Department of Science and Technology Studies at UCL. And there's uh, on the left is John Butterworth. He's professor of physics at UCL. He's part of the Atlas experiment at CERN and author of the book Special Physics about the discovery of the Higgs boson. And there's Elizabeth Dane. Uh, she's a in general internal medicine postdoc, uh, clinical research fellow at John Hopkins um, School of Medicine. Um, she studies institutional policies and cultural norms related to do not resuscitate um, orders at the end of life. Um, so the way um, this panel is organized is that all the panelists um, uh, give a brief presentation, and then we have uh, um, a Q&A session, and they are also all are invited to participate. So, yeah. I'm holding things up. I'm trying <laughs> to get a quick show of hands. Who's a Mac user? Who's a PC user? Who uses both? <laughs> okay, you rule, because I'm having trouble here trying to convert from my Mac to the PC and, and back again. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is go back to the PC, because I've got um, quite a lot of figures that I think are going to be important for you to see. So apologies, we did have some problems earlier, and we hoped that they'd been resolved, but it appears not. But I think it's more important that you see the figures rather than um, I waste your time with slides you can't really read. See, that's the first thing. You have to press Control or Delete on a PC. showing my prowess here, I do apologise. Hurrah! Yes! <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you for going. Do you want me to just back then? Yes, yes, I will. Okay, so my name's Karen. I'm really pleased to be able to be here and to, I think, have a really important conversation. Um, what I'm going to focus on is the particular role of um, scientists in the social media. And what I'm doing is drawing on lots and lots of evidence um, that I've collected together internationally and in the UK. Um, and the big question that I want to ask is really, you know, are scientists any different to other, other users of social media? You know, is there, is there really a problem, I guess, with scientists' use of social media? Or is there anything that we can learn from studies that have been done about how other people use social media and how you can encourage them to go forwards? So hopefully that'll set a nice framework for the following speakers to be able to give you their personal impressions of life. Um, using social media as a scientist or as an academic. So to begin with, um, let's look at the public use of social media then. Um, what I've got here is um, data from two different sources. So um, in the USA, the Science and Engineering Indicators, um, which was released this year, and from a special Eurobarometer from 2013. So that, that's covering um, both European, so the average across all 27 member states, um, and then also the UK data. Um, what um, you can see fairly clearly is that the sources that public groups use for um, science and technology um, are still quite heavily weighted in general towards the traditional media. So television is definitely the most prominent within Europe and within, um, within the UK. Um, there is a bit of a difference there with the American data, as you can see, um, and partly that is because we're asking for the primary source of information. But for the first time um, in the US, it's actually the case that the primary source is now the internet, but it's not social media. So we're getting actually quite low use, um, and this is, um, as I said, the, the sort of public use of social media for information about science and te technology news. All right, then, let's consider it um, from the perspective of scientists. Now, as 
uh, many of you might know, there's sort of very little direct comparison um, in terms of the exact same questions being asked, but this is the closest that I could find. So this is data that's come out of America. Um, and what I like about this study is that um, it's asking scientists, again, sources generally, not sort of just one, one specific area, so we can compare. So what I've drawn out here is the television data, and um, please excuse the, the difference in the way that this is presented, but basically you can see it's similar numbers. So um, about 67, 68% of scientists um, are using television in some way as a source. It might only be occasionally, but they recognise it still as a source of information about science related to their field. Um, we do, however, um, see some really interesting information about the social networks and blogs. And um, this was quite a surprise to me, but it's, um, you can see quite clearly that in you know, things like the science social networks, um, we've got you know, almost 50% of scientists are using um, blogs and science social networks at least occasionally. Um, to source information about their science. Now that's in particular blogs that are maintained by other science, uh, by other scientists, and I think um, we might want to pick up on that later about the sort of ideas of trust and, and you know, with, uh, that they may think that that data is therefore um, more trustworthy. Um, but also um, the science social networks, that's things like um, ResearchGate and things that are set up to try and um, you know, encourage specific scientists' interaction and sharing but also other social networks is, is still fairly high. It is less than half of the population of scientists, but it's, it's still something that scientists are definitely using. So my hypothesis so far is that scientists are actually using social media a lot more than the average person. So in terms of, you know, is it a problem about the, the level that scientists are interacting with social media? I'd say, well, actually, they're doing really well compared to a lot of people. What can we do to, to make it better? Or, or let's explore this a little bit further. So this is the same study from America, University of wisconsin Madison. And um, what is really interesting here is that it's looking at their, their reasons for using or, or the way that they use these different types of sources. So the black lines is never, the gray is that they use it occasionally, and the white is that they use it three times or more a week. So very, very quickly, you can see that over 60% of scientists are actually using social media for personal use more than three times a week. So the hypothesis that they're using social media a lot is, is quite true, but it's for personal reasons. The other ones that are coming through quite strongly tend to be about information. So they're seeking information maybe outside their field or within their field. Um, or they're you know, maybe scanning or exploring the discussions of science, so they're not contributing. You know, they are, they are using it as a medium to access the information much more. The more active ones, tweeting your research. Um, we've got something like 65% of scientists not doing any tweeting about their research. Um, but they, you know, they're getting involved in, in a few things, but I'd say that the social media use for science is much lower. So, my conclusion from, from that sort of little comparison is that, yes, scientists are using social media, just not for science or science communication. So I guess one of the questions for, for us as a group then is, is this a problem? Is it okay if they're just using it for personal use? Or you know, is there a, a real need to, to push people into using it for science as well? So what I thought might also be useful is to see what we can learn from um, different um, public findings around uses of social media. So um, this is some UK-based data. So it's from the Public Attitudes to Science survey released this year. Um, and what it breaks down here is use by age group. So we've got television again, still 60-odd you know, percent of people uh, citing television as being you know, where they most find out about their new scientific research findings. Um, online is sort of around 20% in the main for all adults, but look at social networks. Okay, there's a very big difference there. It's still not huge. It's still only about 20% for, for 16 to 24 year olds. But you can see there's a really big difference in terms of the age of the person and, and, and what they're using as sources. A lot of you might not find this um, very surprising, but it, I think it's really interesting to actually see that data. So here's my next hypothesis, um, which is that it's a generational question, maybe. You know, we leave it long enough and actually you know, new generations of scientists will come through and, and they'll be using social media a lot more for their science. 
Um, the only data that I could find to explore that hypothesis in the UK um, is something from the Research Information Network. So this data is getting on for about six years, something like that now, but I think it's really um, the only data that really breaks down this um, use of different sources by scientists in a lot of detail. So this is the frequency of use by age, okay? So the things that we're interested in here really is the, the bottom, the blue um, amount, which is that they frequently use um, uh, Web 2.0 or social media and um, other sources for science. And then the green is that they occasionally use it, but the yellow is never. Okay, so we've got the under 25s, over half of them were actually reporting that they never used any form of online and, and um, social media sources. So in one sense, I'd say that, you know, that definitely tells us that actually it's not really a generational issue for scientists. There's something more sort of fundamental there about what encourages scientists to take up, um, science, uh, to take up social media for scientific purposes. So here's um, another couple of findings from the same study. So let's have a look at gender. Um, so the over, well, around about 50% of women are actually reporting at this point, never using social media and other forms of online media. Um, and the men, you can see that it's a lower proportion that don't, and it's a higher proportion that do frequently. So there definitely seems to be some kind of um, gender difference. Um, and then, the other one that I wanted to draw out was actually the level of support. So the figure on the right is talking about how much do, um, do people do frequent, occasional and, and non-users um, report that they have support from their local department or um, from their research group. And you can see frequent users, you know, it's only 40%, there's still 60% of them who kind of say, you know, they don't care what I do or they don't like it or whatever. But it's a lot higher than the people who are saying that they never do it. So, so the people who are not involved really don't feel that there's any support or encouragement or, you know, ideas that this is a good thing. So I think that's quite significant and that can explain, I think, why a lot of people don't get involved in, in social media um, for, for research purposes or for linked into their research. So that's my little conclusion from that part, that gender and level of local support and encouragement actually influence scientists' uh, social media use. Um, so the last couple of things I wanted to show you are just um, little sort of tidbits of findings that I've found that might be useful, sort of more for discussion really. I wouldn't say that these are sort of deep um, research outcomes across you know, a lot of different studies. But the first one is around trust. And as I said before, I think there is a lot of evidence about, about the influence of trust. Um, so um, this is actually taken from the same data that the uh, Research Information Network report came from. Um, but what they found was that many researchers are discouraged from making use of new forms of scholarly communications because they're unable to put trust in resources that have not been subject to traditional peer review. Now, as I said, this came from 2010. At that point, they were predicting that in five years' time, there'd be a dramatic revolution in the use of peer review and how it was handled. And I know we've got a session on that later today, which I think will be um, really interesting to, to explore some of these questions. Um, but the fact is that you know it, it was a very very strong finding, and and I, you know what I wonder is, is is this still true today? Um, another one. This is actually coming from a more general um, use of um, social media. So, what are the factors that are influencing the willingness to contribute to um, different online communities? And these were the, the main things that, that came up in this particular study. So it was the perceived value of contributing. What do people get out of it? Um, whether they get some kind of you know tangible reward or recognition for it. Um, their social approval, so you know, do other people think that it's a good thing for them to be doing? Um, but one thing that was not discovered or was, was, was absolutely recognised as not contributing was the perceived cost, so the effort or the time that's involved actually was much, much less of a problem than the other things were an incentive, if that makes sense. So the, the barriers weren't as strong as um, the incentives to actually make people or, or to encourage people to, to use it. Um, the last thing I just wanted to cover is something that I suspect a lot of you are already familiar with. This came out from Jacob Nielsen um, yeah, quite a long time ago now, 2006. The sort of 99-1 rule of, of interaction in, in social media. And I think we've seen that quite clearly from some of the earlier data. So the idea is that 90% um, of 
postings are coming from just 1% of users, a very, very small group. How do we encourage this 9% um, of people who um, post very occasionally to increase their rates, or more importantly, these people that aren't involved at all, or maybe they're just lurking? Um, so this uh, advice came out a long time ago, but for me, when I was thinking about this session, I think it still really actually rings true. Um, it does have to be easier to contribute. And what that means is sort of tying it into, you know, your, your daily routine. So is there a point in time or, or place when, you know, you, you can fit in doing, you know, tweeting or blogging or things like that. Um, making participation a side effect. And I think you can really see the effect of that in conferences. So if there's a conference um, hashtag that people are following, you gather a lot more support. And I think a lot of people, a lot of researchers do tweet a lot more, you know, when, when it's part of something else that they're doing. Um, edit not creating, as you'll know, there's, it's much easier for a lot of people to edit something or retweet it rather than to create it. Um, rewarding participants and promoting quality. That's not so much about curating necessarily what they're doing, but as a community, it comes back to that support question. So, you know, if you see somebody who's just starting on Twitter and maybe, you know, not quite sure about what they're doing, encouraging them to keep going and to, you know, retweet. And there's some really good people out there who I know do that quite often, and I jump one of them, but who, who you know, spots people and, and kind of just helps them through that initial stage of being a bit scared of using some of these information. So I'm just going to leave that with you. It's, it's from quite a long time ago, but I think it really does um, ring true today. And hopefully that'll stimulate lots of um, further discussion with what we're going on. Thank you very much, Karen. So now we go to John about your experience in joining social media. I have no slides. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Is that okay? Can you hear me? Um, so yeah, now we've had the data, now for the anecdotes, I guess. <laughs> I, I'm a particle physicist. I work at um, well, not the road at UCL, but also at CERN. And I guess my so my experience as a scientist with social media is very heavily tainted by the huge public interest that there was in the starting of the Large Hadron Collider and and the um, the discovery of the Higgs boson in the end. Um, so that I, I guess the what I just to give you the background. I, I do Twitter quite a lot. I I use Facebook reasonably a lot, and I'm still fending off LinkedIn and ResearchGate and various other things. Um, I, I, well, I have a Google Plus account as well. Um, the the, the um, my experiment seems to use Google Plus very heavily because we've made some videos, but then the rest of it is tumbleweed, so I don't really know what goes on there. The, the, the way I got into it, given that we're talking about trust, um, I know why I started with Twitter account. It's burned on my mind because there was an article, I think, in the Sunday Times um, that said that the government was considering pulling out of CERN, which is, was a massive uh, problem for me before the LHC started. Um, that was when there were, there were lots of problems with science funding, but in particular with my research council, STFC. And um, there was Lord Drayson was the science minister, and he started arguing with this with Brian Cox on Twitter. And I thought, okay, I trust those people. I, they, they're reliable sources. They're identified individuals. I know Brian personally. I know, I know Lord Drayson is a science minister. And in fact, I was on period, um, advisory panels and talking to research council people and civil servants, and had never got direct contact with the science minister until that discussion. And that really broke through. And that's one of the one of the big lessons, um, one of the big advantages, I think, and one of the big things scientists should be using, exploiting in Twitter, both in both directions, is this aspect of permeability. If you've got someone you know who you're talking to, that's inside of an organisation, but is a person who has a, a personality online that can really make a difference to the perception of it. And I've seen that in play with CERN, which, you know, from various points of view, can look very odd to outsiders. But once you start seeing that there are actual people in there who are using Twitter, not maybe for promoting science all the time, occasionally, but, but it's important that it's not all the time, because I think it humanizes large organizations. And it also happens with UCL. We've seen, you know, individual tweeters from UCL suddenly stop UCL looking quite so corporate and foolish occasionally, and that helps. Um, so I think this, this aspect of permeability and the fact that everyone says this is a personal account, not a corporate account, I don't know whether that would stand up in court, but it certainly helps in terms of usage. Um, I think, I mean, we already mentioned, but I didn't call it Shirtstorm. Uh, shirt, Shirtgate I would, uh, is the new one on me, but I saw the Shirtstorm hashtag going around. I think that is, to me, a, a, been a great shame, and I think the cycle of um, an unfortunate incident with someone wearing 
inappropriate shirt, in my opinion, um, and being justifiably criticised for it as part of a discussion of the whole exciting event. And then that's suddenly descending into abuse from a minority of people. First of all, abuse to the people who criticised the shirt and then abuse to the guy who wore it way beyond the, the crime that he committed, as far as I can see. Um, and I, I haven't seen him get any death threats, I have to say, but, but it's, it's not been terribly helpful. And I think ESA and the scientists, you could say maybe they had other things on their mind, but um, if you're engaged in social media, you can't just take two days off while you land the comic. You've got to keep it up. And I think that was a mistake. I hope they rectify it and see how it goes. But that, to me, there was a failure of permeability. It would have been quite easy to diffuse that quite early on, I think, if it had been done better, because the initial criticisms of the guy were sensible and respectful, and, and but, but valid, in my opinion, and it could have been dealt with without that confrontation. Um, but there is this element of confidence building. I think, um, I, with the, back to the CERN thing, I, I was started a, a ride of, um, can you tell me when I've, I've lost track of time? Can you tell me when I've got a couple of minutes? Okay. Um, the, um, we, we were very exposed to the media, um, much way beyond the experience of anything I'd had before. Um, and uh, I remember going on to the Today program or something to talk about how we were spending public money on the Higgs. And being terrified that I would say something stupid, but, but being very strongly reassured by the fact that a lot of journalists I knew, a lot of them followed me on Twitter and a lot of colleagues would follow what I could. I had a public forum, albeit microscopic compared to Radio 4, but very heavily bi biased in favour of people who actually cared about their opinion. To, to correct any mistakes I might make, or, or to say, you know, I, I'm sorry, I wish I'd done it differently, or I didn't mean to say that, or whatever. Now, maybe that was illusory, but it helped me a lot, and, and I, I didn't need to actually apologize for anything, but maybe I would have done if I hadn't had that buffer calming me down when I was arguing with John Humphreys. Um, so that direct public voice is really important, and that's, again, part of this permeability thing. I think it made the, the science journalism much more permeable to me, and that really helped that I knew some of the, the, some of the people Via, on, on, uh, via Twitter, mainly. Um, of course, you use it as a, a news feed, and this, this business of picking up reliable information and trustworthy information, mainly through links, right? I mean, if you've got an identified Twitter pers person you know on Twitter, you know their job, then of course you will trust what they say on the whole, if, if you think their job is a trustworthy job. But, um, but a lot of the stuff is linked to the archive or to peer review papers. And in that case, um, the trust issue it's nothing to do, you really are using it as a news feed and it's the, new, the, tr the thing you link to is whether you decide when you trust it. It's not the social media. It's not the social media that makes the difference there. I find that kind of useful. There's a limit of corporate news on corporate news feeds, but, but finding out news and interesting links from Twitter is definitely something I do. And that's where I get, I have heard about important science news that way more quickly than I've heard it through other media or through the coffee room discussions with colleagues. Um, I think there are important differences in the trust business um, and, and risks involved that might put scientists off when uh, career stage is very important. So I'm, I'm lucky in that I'm a trust and I'm okay. And so if, I, if, I, if I'm better known in some circles than others for writing a, a silly book about particle physics and tweaking a lot, that's not really going to damage my career because I'm already a stellar scientist. If you're a student or a postdoc, that can be a risk, even if you're an absolutely excellent one with a great career ahead of you. If you become better known for being on social media than you are for writing papers, that's definitely going to have a, a risk attached to it. And it's a very close, I'm thinking about this before this, this talk, I think it reflects the wider concerns about public engagement. And um, in my field, at least, when I was a student, there was a culture change in that public engagement was suddenly seen as an important thing to do. And I think we see the fruits of that with the, with the LHC engagement, and that it hasn't just been one or two. PR people out there, there's been a whole community of scientists willing to explain what's going on and why they're keen on it. Um, I think that's, a, that's taken a generation, and I was part maybe the first generation of that as a PhD student. I got that message, and now I'm the head of the department, and I still give out that message. And I think, it, in that, at least in my field, that works. But it's not clear that extends it to, to social media entirely. It extends to journalism, it extends to blogging, I think, it extends to um, to the media, it extends to giving public talks and schools talks and things, but I'm not sure it really extends to Twitter, I have to say. And I think it should, um, and I think that's something we can think about and discuss. Um, there are obviously limitations in trust. I mean, the classic example is this paper in the Wiley Journal Ethology with the, should we cite the crappy Gabor paper line in it, which has now got an out metric off this planet, 
because it's been tweeted so many times, not one they wanted probably. So there are misleading indicators, of course, and it's so possible to, to do that. Um, I, I guess I'll summarize and say that permeability, the, the, the main uses I find for it, which I, I think not in contradiction with what Karen just showed in terms of the data, the main one is this permeability um, and the humanizing and personalizing of large organizations showing that they're not homogeneous often, actually. I mean, people from the same organization having a different slant on an event helps sometimes. Um, the newsfeed aspect definitely works for me, um, finding out things from there first and then being the person in the coffee room to talk about it, rather than picking up the gossip in the, in the coffee room. And then conversations. I have to say, I, I do have conversations on Twitter. Um, there are not, not many rants by scientists on there, I think. Um, we don't use it as much for conversation, perhaps. Uh, well, rants are not necessarily a good form of conversation either, but um, the, the, there are small one-to-one -one conversations occasionally. I have to say that is much more done between scientists is done on Facebook. And I think we talk mostly about Twitter here, but if I look at usage by scientists, it's much heavier on Facebook. And so the, my, my collaboration is 3,000 scientists. There are 3,000 more on the rival one. And the theoretical physicists, and a lot of us are just friends. We know each other. And there's a network, a very strong friend network on Facebook there. I have a few hundred friends on Facebook, which is much less than my Twitter followers, but they're much more engaged. And they're people I do know, um, all of them. And, uh, and they include then also old school friends, you know, UCL colleagues who are not physicists, um, family. And there's a spread out effect there. As science. So people do post on Facebook when they've written a paper they're pleased with. And it will go to people who are not scientists that way, maybe in some ways more effectively than it does on Twitter. There's more conversation there often as well. Um, having said that, is there, a science pro is there a specific science problem? I, in my anecdotal experience, I don't think so. So looking at, um, my, my Twitter feed is very heavily biased by scientists and public engagement. My Facebook one is much more of a normal person's experience, although there are lots of my friends are scientists. Um, and But looking at my family and my school friends and, and, and colleagues in other academic disciplines, I don't see a very different pattern of usage. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, this no, yeah, your experience. Um, so I have a bit of a different perspective being um, a doctor, um, but I think there's parallels between medicine and science, um, especially in the realm of social media. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about trust and medicine and medical facts and that sort of thing. Um, trust and mistrust has always been a very important part of medicine, um, and arguably the availability of inter information on the internet, um, as well as wider dissemination of news and sens sensationalization of political and current events, um, has weakened public trust for doctors. Um, there's been you know, the Alan Shipman scandal, there's been NHS scandals um, in the news, which has changed the way um, that people perceive how doctors um, are trustworthy, their professionalism and that sort of thing. Um, you know, this panel is on real world networking versus social networking and medicine at its fundamental, um, most fundamentally um, embodies a very personal relationship between the doctor and patient and so, Doctors have actually struggled quite a bit with how um, this relationship is to be translated to the internet and social media. Um, the internet has been a great equalizer um, and it's brought knowledge to a lot of people that wasn't previously accessible. This empowerment, um, I think, makes, people, uh, makes a lot of, um, has a lot of advantages, but also a lot of disadvantages. Patients are able to access a lot of knowledge that they weren't able to before. Um, there's internet forums and communities that allow them to get together with other patients and talk about their patient experiences. Um, this has created um, more of a demand, I think, for patient choice um, and patient autonomy in the doctor-patient relationship, more personally in the clinic. But on the other hand, um, I think the risk is that patients can be overwhelmed by the amount of choice there is, um, by the amount of information. Um, it's hard to control how much information and what information is passed on into the internet and whether or not that's trustworthy. Um, there can be, for example, pharmaceutical interests that are saying things, um, people who are advocating things that may not be scientifically correct. Um, so I think that um, there's a lot of interesting things that we need to think about um, in, in the medical realm in terms of science communication. 
Um, but this isn't a new thing. Um, so as Karen mentioned, television was the first um, first transmission of information between um, about scientific facts or non-facts to the public. Um, so Baywatch, for example, so my research is on um, do not resuscita uh, resuscitate decision making of um, CPR at the end of life. And a lot of what people see about what CPR is are from television shows such as Baywatch or um, other medical shows, um, which can be inaccurate. Um, there was one study actually done uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, which showed um, the, this, the researchers watched every episode of ER, Chicago Hope, and Rescue 911, um, which is, I, th I think is a great experiment for the scientists themselves. Um, and 77% 77, 77 of the people, the characters in the show who had a cardiac arrest um, survived to hospitalization. Um, and 37% of the people survived to discharge um, after basically dying and then having CPR done on them. But actually the reality is very different. 20% of people usually survive to hospitalization and only about 4% survive to discharge. So there's a, a great disconnect between what people are seeing on the, uh, the internet and on television and what actually happens. And so I think this can affect the, the trust that occurs in the doctor-patient relationship because then they're like, well, you know, so many people survive CPR, how could you be telling me perhaps that CPR might not be the best thing for my loved one and that can create tensions. There's been a lot of examples um, in the news even of um, things that may influence how what um, the information that people get and what sort of trust people have in physicians and the medical profession. Um, the Daily Mail is I think a good example of some of the mistrust and uh, misinformation that may maybe out there in terms of, um, especially the Liverpool Care Pathway, which um, some of you may have heard of. This was something that um, was in the news quite a bit last year. Um, it was basically a gold standard pathway for palliative care. So a way to help people um, uh, pass away and die um, that, was, that was, I think, um, a dignified way to um, pass away, but it was perceived um, in a lot of the media as being a death pathway and uh, doctors just killing off patients that they didn't want to spend money on. Um, and I think that was highly problematic. I think because of things like this, there can be um, a lot of hesitation of doctors and scientists to participate in conversations. Um, there's a lack of trust in um, you know, perhaps journalists misconstruing messages or um, their messages that they write taking, um, being taken the wrong way there is a concern for losing control of their message. Um, and I actually had a bit of a personal experience with this. I, I wrote an article for a magazine about resuscitation um, and CPR, um, and I had a different title. And then I opened the magazine and saw that um, it said resuscitation should be allowed to die peacefully, which wasn't at all what I was trying to say. I was saying that in some cases it might be beneficial to have the person be not for resuscitation rather than all of resuscitation just not being allowed. And so, so this is, I think, one of those examples of um, your message perhaps being misconstrued. And, and that, you know, especially I think with medicine and these sort of um, uh, uh, therapies and, and treatments that can actually have a very personal effect on people and change people's lives, um, I think the stakes are rather high in terms of how your message is being perceived. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, some people argue that the way to ensure that your message is correctly transmitted is just to do so personally in the doctor-patient relationship or um, personally with scientists and, and individuals, but that can also be very difficult because, you know, doctors have 10 minutes to talk to the patient and there's not enough time in the consultation room or in the hospital and there's so much misinformation out there. Um, I mean, lack of time to actually communicate with the patients and families and so we actually kind of perhaps do have responsibility to um, try to disseminate um, information as much as we can. Um, you mentioned uh, that there may be some risks to um, disseminating information, especially for academics and people who want to be taken seriously by um, the academic community. Um, I think many of you have heard of the Kardashian Index, which was a paper that talked about the discrepancies of social media profiles for scientists. Um, this, uh, this uh, scientist uh, thought that people should get off Twitter and write those papers. Um, I don't blame Kim Kardashian or scientific equivalents for exploiting their fame. Who wouldn't? However, I think it's time we develop a metric that will clearly indicate if a scientist has an overblown public profile, 
so we can adjust our expectations of them accordingly. So I think there's um, there's an opinion uh, there's there are thoughts out there that you know people should just get off Twitter and actually just do <laughs> real science and stop you know I guess uh, trying to become famous um, from that sort of thing. Um, and he, you also mentioned um, you know people who are not at the professor level or that sort of thing. Um, having more challenges in social media. And I've actually been told by my supervisors to stop blogging and writing articles because I need to focus on publishing in peer reviewed journals. Um, so I think these are some challenges that everyone, uh, that people can deal with when trying to um, work with social media. But I also think there are really great advantages to doing so and we can use that in um, our research as well as in patient care. So um, I had written an article and it was really great to see some of the comments that people had written um, at, in response to the article. This was a, a particular one on the Liverpool Care Pathway. Um, and I, I loved the, the last paragraph because it just sort of made me think about interventions that I could personally create or maybe studies that I could do in the future that would be more patient centered. Um, and I think that there's definitely a lack of communication of you know what patients actually want and what where the research agenda is going and so these sort of um, you know public communication um, from the scientists to the community can also have a two-way thing and you know you can read the comments and, and think of different things to do um, you know in the future um, other ways I think that are really helpful in medicine as well as public health um, that can take advantage of social media um, are in public health and crisis situations um, so, you know, we're all trying to find ways to improve society and to improve the way in which we're, um, uh, you know, people's health and that sort of thing. And I think that we can use social media to improve that. So, for example, um, influenza surveillance uh, versus uh, uh, via Google searches and Twitter have actually been more effective at seeing trends of epidemics than traditional sources. Um, locations of vaccinations for H1N1 were announced via Twitter, and there was a huge um, uh, amount of people that just came to these different sites um, very quickly. Um, and there's better dis uh, disaster response and coordination um, that's also occurred through Twitter and social media. Um, crowdsourcing of medical knowledge has been used by both doctors and patients um, to great advantage um, for both. Um, Websites such as Patients Like Me um, have helped both research as well as patient advocacy. Um, this particular website creates uh, patient reported data for people with diseases where there may not be a large number of people with these particular diseases. So crowdsourcing information has helped um, research progress in this area. Um, and, and I think what Patients Like Me has found is that people actually want to share this data and they find um, both community as well as um, an empowerment in their ability to share this data through these sort of platforms. So there's been a lot of discussion uh, about what the ethics of social media should be for doctors and, and scientists. Um, there's, I think, um, been a, quite a bit of backlash against doctors, for example, who may be using social media in the wrong way um, to inspire fame. Um, Dr. Oz um, is a US television show. Um, he's a physician at Columbia and he does a lot of things that people think are pseudoscience. Um, so he had, uh, he posed a question uh, the other day on uh, what's your biggest question for me? And some of the responses were quite scathing. Um, so how do I get my patients to stop believing your bull? Um, if all the diet aids, your hype works, um, if all the diet aids your hype, you hype work so well, how come my patients who use them are still fat? Um, who needs science and ethics when pseudoscience is so much more lucrative? And what kind of fruit juice do you recommend as an alternative to chemotherapy? Um, so I think that this is, this is quite problematic. Um, as, as professionals, we need to be careful about the kind of science and medicine that we're um, conveying to people. I mean, I don't expect most people to be doing these sort of things, but you know, it's just something to think about, you know, how your message is being conveyed. Um, the, the GMC, General Medical Council, the AMA, a lot of um, organi medical organizations in most countries, uh, most, a lot of countries have set up different um, regulations and guidelines for how doctors should interact with the public. Um, there's, there's been a lot of controversy. Um, so one of the um, American College of Physicians actually said that physicians should separate their personal professional identities. That's almost impossible online. 
um, because it's very artificial when patients go to the doctor's office. It's not like the doctor pretends to not be a person and takes away all their family photos and doesn't engage in conversation about anything beyond medicine. So I think that's sort of a bit too extreme. Um, but I think that we need to think about how we um, how we can uh, communicate with the public and especially how that might affect trust of the the patient pop uh, of, of the community and the society in general. Um, physicians can um, if they have um, if they post things, for example, um, that may be inappropriate or maybe unprofessional, that can have consequences for both their medical career, but also um, can undermine public trust in, in the medical profession. So I think overall, there's a lot of power um, to use, um, sorry, we can use the power of the internet to convey messages um, both about science and medicine, but we need to be careful about how we do it, and especially with doctors, um, you know, thinking about how um, how people trust um, doctors and how this can affect their trust in doctors. Thank you. So there's, there's a question about um, sort of hesitation maybe by scientists to to expose themselves on social media because with, uh, with this there comes also responsibility in the role. Is that something that researchers found? Yeah, I think from a, a few different perspectives. I mean, the, the reasons were quite varied depending on their age and demographics and things. I mean, one thing that did come through was discipline. Um, it does vary quite a lot by discipline, as you might imagine, computer scientists um, get involved a lot more, medical, medical doctors a lot less. Um, and, you know, I think the, the issues around that, that John raised around um, um, position, career position, um, play quite strongly. But I don't know. It's it's funny my Kardashian index is too high as well. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't save you from that. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and, and sort of, um, sort of in, in the career stages, that was almost something I wrote down was from, from John. Um, what what is the distribution of people like, on social media? Is, is there... um, I don't I don't have it obviously. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. Um, have, have you ever had any bad sort of experience in, in or regrets joining Twitter or um, social media? I, I think for a while I got I was using it too much, and I was tweeting when I was at home on the couch, and I should have been reading the story to my kids. That's about the thing. <laughs> I, I've got over that now. There was maybe a honeymoon period when it was a bit obsessive. Um, it, professionally speaking. Um, not really. I mean, I, th there was one instance in a conference where a colleague of mine made an interesting side comment, which I tweeted, and I and within a minute she got an email from the director of the relevant laboratory saying that's not a very helpful thing to say. Um, I felt a bit embarrassed about that. I, I, I kind of I think I had it's an example of being followed by a key target group, and obviously the obviously the, the media person from that laboratory was following me and had seen this tweet and had denied it on Twitter. But then it also told the director who then sent the email. So, you know, I, I, that alerted me to to maybe unforeseen consequences. Um, I still don't really regret that though, because it was a comment in a public meeting that it was a correct comment in my view, but it may have damaged my colleague unintentionally rather than it, it may have done. Actually. So I regret that, but I don't think it was really a problem of tweeting it with a hashtag. Um, no, I think I think that's really it so far. I mean, I'm always because I've always identified myself and I've always had a fairly responsible position I'm quite careful and I, I try not to tweet after a certain number of drinks for instance <laughs> <laughs> try not to are these problems that any of you also sort of have experienced in, in joining social media um, sort of being exposed um, on, on a broader stage having as a scientist maybe uh, having an expect expectation on Conveying trust and, and um, very curated tweets. Because, you know, you know it's, that, that's often, often the problem, of course, when, when we talk about trust is, um, you know, do you, who do you follow, who do you trust, and, and what they tweet. Um, and that's, that's also especially the case, you know, with all these medical issues such as Ebola, there's been a lot of, you know, that's a lot of rubbish out there. And, and, it's very, very difficult to, to present a, a sort of a 
to respond to the lawyers that you mentioned? Yeah, no, I mean, I think Ebola is particularly interesting because there's such, there have been such limited cases in, well, I, I guess in the US, but also in Europe, um, but it's been blown out of proportion so much. And I think actually the way that um, the social media has um, uh, looked at the particular physician in New York who was diagnosed with Ebola and tracking his every step and announcing that he was at this restaurant and that tube station and everything I thought was actually quite inappropriate and unfortunate because there are many other problems that are much more important. Um, you know, for example, influenza kills way more people than Ebola in, in you know, most places. And so you know, I think it changes the way that um, people think about, um, you know, fear and that sort of thing. But if, been, if people then decided maybe to be more outspoken, I mean, pick responsible people and, and sort of try to stem all this kind of hype and, and bad publicity. It's, it's hard to do so. I mean, Ebola is obviously a, a legitimate threat. And so, you know, you know, I get a lot of emails from both my hospital as well as seeing what's in the public media. And, you know, there is understandable concern, but I think it's just hard to balance that sometimes between, okay, well, we need to be prepared for what actually is going to potentially happen, but also trying to tell the public, okay, you know, things, things are okay. Um, one thing I have noticed is that at least in Facebook, and I've read a couple articles about this and you know, other magazines as well, is that people do tend to get very hyped up um, on social media more so than in person. It's always easier to, you know, yell at someone and be sort of inappropriate um, and argue with them when you can't see the person. And I think that that's a problem sometimes with social media. Yes, please. Um, hi, I'm Trish Groves. I'm one of the deputy editors at the British Medical Journal, BMJ, and I'm the head of research there. And I'm a bit of an um, addicted tweeter. Um, just uh, particularly on, uh, thanks very much. I'm sorry I came in a bit late, but uh, what I saw was great and, and uh, spot on. Ha -ha. Um, but uh, on, on Ebola particularly, the hashtag was so important for getting the full picture. Because at the same time you were picking up those stories from New York, you were picking up the stories from MSF in Liberia or wherever it was, or you were following the debate on whether or not WHO had, had really you know, dropped the ball. Um, and uh, anybody here who tweets, for God's sake, make sure that you use hashtags because they really make a hell of a difference. The search on Twitter is not good, but if you use hashtags, then you really can join up all of the elements of a debate. And when that happens, it tends to be self-correcting in my experience. Somebody publishes a poor paper, you know about it pretty soon because of the post-publication peer review that happens on Twitter, and it can be really effective. Um, and when it happens to things we publish, we then contact those people and say, send us an e-letter, uh, we'll get the authors engaged and we'll get a correction if necessary. So uh, use social media responsibly, and you can get really good post-publication peer review. Um, yeah, that's tied into something that's um, coming up on the Twitter stream quite a lot, which um, there's quite a few people who are um, slightly unhappy, John, with your suggestion that as a PhD researcher or an early career researcher, that it might not be the best thing to do to um, have a high social media profile. Um, mm -hmm. There's also another comment which I think is very um, apt, which is that everyone's so busy tweeting um, about social media that no one's actually asking the panel any questions. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, very good point from Ali Jennings there. Thank you very much. Maybe for those people, on, since I can't tweet while I'm here, I didn't. I wasn't implying it was a bad thing. I was implying that there may be an attitude problem with senior academics about it. Uh, that's all. I, wasn't, I don't share that. Attitude. I mean, that might be an interesting thing to get people to to. Um, chat about you know is there is there something we can do to overcome that kind of perception of senior academics so that it's not appropriate Hi, I'm Alexis Webb. I'm a postdoc at UCL, and and I think when you you, you make that comment, you keep perpetuating that mm -hmm. just by saying it. I mean, it's definitely true, but I think you're in a position to maybe start saying something different, and and so by continuing to say it, it, it just stays in everybody's the back of everybody's brain. Yeah, okay. Can I? Sorry. Yep. Sure. I, 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 there's a danger there, yes, I agree. I, I had hoped that in, I put it in the context of encouraging more public engagement, which I think in my field we've done successfully, which I very strongly support and do support. 
and I extend that support to public me to social media. What I was trying to say is maybe our community, maybe our community, meaning the academic community, needs to be more conscious that public engagement happens very effectively via social media and the same support should be extended to it. That was what I was intending to say. I'm sorry if it came over differently, but you know, the glories of social media, maybe that can be corrected, but that's what I meant. You're right that by calling out a problem, you can't perpetuate it, but I think also by ignoring it, you don't help. And I've had that comment to me from so many junior researchers that that's why they don't do things, and I think you have to take it head on. And that my message to senior academics would be that one should recognise that very effective public engagement happens via social media, and it should be treated with the same respect that other, all other public engagement is treated with. Yeah. Um, so this is something that I've dealt with quite a bit over the past few years, and I think that one of the things that discourages um, early career investigators from using public media um, and blogging is that there's so much um, of a structure focused on trying to get peer reviewed publications for promotion, tenure, um, or for just for getting a job. And I think that um, you know, social media is changing the landscape of academia and we need to think about how we can change the incentive structures of academia so that it encourages scientists to engage with the public. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk on open access and that sort of thing, but I think we also need to engage it to like, well, how do, do things like the REF and um, grant, um, grant cycles and promotion and tenure um, count things like publications in, in um, non-academic uh, journals. I was, I was just going to sort of add to that to conversation actually. I went, I'm a new PhD student started a month ago and um, my supervisor was practicing at academic university and part of the comments I went off to a conference last week was I look forward to uh, seeing what you're tweeting about it. So there, there are certain signs that are moving that way. Can I make one? Yes. Just to follow up on that comment. Um, the, the REF, the Research Excellence Framework, I was the, univer the, the um, unit of assessment lead for physics at UCL and we were looking at our impact cases and I know in, so in, impact, those of you who are familiar with academia will know that impact has been very controversial. It's a, a way of trying to measure impact outside of academia. We put three public engagement cases in. I think they were very strong. We haven't had the results back yet, but and, and social media form part of that. They're, they're actually a measurable um, aspect of what you do. Now, I've pointed out that metrics can be misleading, but, but in a, something like the REF, you've got a chance to tell the story, but not just the numbers, but the numbers help. And, uh, and obviously, if the numbers are, I got tweeted about because I wrote a bad paper, that's not going to help. But if you, if you show that a, a piece of work that you did was discussed heavily on social media, it's actually rather easy to get the evidence of that, more so than if it's in the coffee room. And um, I, I think our department, I think UCL will benefit from that in physics because of public engagement certainly and some of that by social media um, yeah, sorry i've got the microphone it yeah. was a mistake um cameron allen from plos um I, I find it interesting we come around keep coming around to this conversation about the disadvantages of being public and yet we don't and yet i know you could point to several people um young early career researchers who've both got jobs got funding um, got substantial funding have startups are doing stuff based on the fact of, of being public in some sense or other and my own career actually built on that as as an aside my second most highly cited piece of work happens to be a blog post um, which has 150 citations um, but in terms of the, the the subject of trust i think there's the inverse thing which we, we tend to miss that being public and having a presence and having a profile means that people are actually willing to help you because they know who you are. I mean, John mentioned this, po this point of knowing who, who, um, who Brian was, knowing who um, Lord Drayson was. But that sense of being out there and, and cultivating a profile so that when you have a problem, and I find this frequently, I ask a question, I get answers. Um, people want to help. There are real advantages, I mean, really serious advantages for researchers who are facing problems day to day um, in terms of building the trust which encourages people to engage back with you. So it's not just about public engagement, it's about building the network that's help, going to help you do the research. It's a very good point. Um, yeah, something. Um, I was just going to say, I think it's really interesting that you used the Neil Hall article because I think, uh, the Kardashian index, because I think that's a really good example of the risks 
of that kind of, of engagement because I think when you read the whole article, he's being really heavily ironic and he's making fun of the senior academics who kind of who don't see tweeting as something that's important. And the other really key thing about that article is that it came out in the same week as impact factors. It's making fun of metrics. And I think that's a really like a good example of where actually that that is a risk that people might misinterpret you. And I think that's something that's happened quite a lot with that article when I've heard people talking about it. Yeah, it depends a lot on what what you, what you do and how you, as Cameron says, what, what your network is and how you use the social media. Right? Um, sorry, yeah, so this is about uh, YouTube scientists or science YouTubers who have huge, huge followers and are kind of massively look for for scientific information, but very often have no actual scientific qualification. It does not mean they're not good, but I just wanted to know what your thoughts on that were since they disseminate a vast amount of information to the public. Um, yeah, um, I think what you're talking about there is the difference between um, respected science or, or people who are, who are working full time as scientists versus the sort of people who are just propagating some kind of idea about science. Um, as you, I'm sure you're aware, YouTube is the second highest used uh, search engine. Um, it's, so its use is very, very high. Um, it's not used by scientists. Um, I think that is a problem. Um, I don't particularly have an opinion on um, what we can, or, or whether it's detrimental that people are accessing science in other ways. I think if it's a very um, biased view, it is by, by off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you whether the, you know, the information that's already on YouTube is all wrong. There's there, some very I mean, good stuff on there, but... I mean, there, yeah. is, there, there is, I know, of very effective <coughs> 60 symbols, which yeah. has got really, really high view figures as far as that goes. <coughs> Certainly, compared to my blog posts, they do very well. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, and really, I was pointing the camera at, at academics in their offices and talking, and they're, they're a reputable source, mm -hmm. and they're very widely watched, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be done. It's probably not... You've got the data, it's obviously not done that widely, but yeah. that one I've been aware of. And it's very, it seems to be very widely watched. Okay, I think we have to wrap it up. I mean, uh, there's a lot of points that have been raised in the discussion, and I think there's a lot of food for discussion in, in the coffee breaks uh, later on. But I think now we have workshops. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. In here we have how to build your profile as a scientist. I'm going to put this back to Mike because you want me to move. So, um, in here is how to build your profile as a scientist. In Steel, we have sharing sensitive data, and in Franks, we have measuring social impacts appropriately enough. Um, the easiest way to get